What's up guys and gals? My name is Splattercat. We are here at the Nerd Castle and you'll forgive me for just a moment. I saw it out of the corner of my eye. My microphone just went eek and like rolled around in a circle because the screw is loose on it. I go through a lot of wear and tear on recording related accessories. You would be very, very surprised. So I've dumped pretty much everything out of my bag. And I know that in the last couple episodes we haven't really done anything interesting. So I was figuring today we'll go on a bit of an adventure and we'll see what we can find out here. It's minus seven. We've got more than enough food to get by for a day or two. We've got more than enough water to get by for a day or two. And so I'm figuring since we've gone to all the effort of front-loading our future survival, I think that we can go out and this is one of the actual benefits of having a good food supply in a survival situation. If you're always hunting and foraging and you're always looking for things to eat, especially if they're... Lo can we shoot the birds, I wonder? With a rifle, it would be an utter waste, but I'd, I'd be interested to find out. Like, I wouldn't waste a bullet on a bird. In real life, I'd look for a bigger game, especially. I think we have a... What's our gun? What kind of gun are we carrying? Let's see here. A 303? Yeah. I totally... I wouldn't waste a 303 round on a bird. This is a... This is a very, very specific tool for a very specific job if you're trying to survive. And so you need to make sure that your resources are stored over the long term. But anyways, as I was talking about previously... In a survival situation, what you'll find actually a lot of the time, as this game properly shows, is that you're not going to have time to do everything you want to do each day, and so you have to prioritize. Now, one of the things that we've done is we've prioritized a long-term food supply, which is very, very good for us. Because we have that, we now have leisure time, which is something that's very important. Either we can spend time entertaining ourselves, we can walk around the hills looking for new sources that we can scavenge from. But by and large, having extra time in a survival situation is a good thing, and it means that you've taken care of all the needs that you have. So, now that we have all those things, let's have a look around the map. And I think there's only a couple areas we haven't been in. One of my only complaints about this game is that the maps are very, very small. As I said in the previous episode, what I'd like to see from the developers is I would absolutely love to see the developers, like, string the maps together somehow so that it's a big world that you have to survive in. Like, five or six maps. They're working on one right now. Just make, like, a little tunnel that goes to the next map if you don't want to connect them physically so that you can do it in a seamless environment. It all seems cool to me anyways, and that deer totally just teleported backwards. What a bamf, he's got all kinds of magical space powers or something. I am the Martian deer. The Martyr. That seems pretty awesome. I think Martyr works. I think that's what I'd go for. Now if we go up to the top of this hill right here, it's unfortunate that a storm just kicked in. Because I wasn't expecting it. Nobody expects the storm in the middle of the Arctic tundra, no. I, I, I was hoping we would actually have a day where we could explore, and unfortunately it's looking like we're going to max out our cold pretty quickly. Drink some water real fast, and then I'm going to go up to the top of this hill, and my guess is that it's going to overlook a valley preceding the dam. If spatially I think I'm in the right spot, which I'm pretty sure that I am. I think I, I've got a good feel for the map right now in between my own personal playthroughs and also the playthroughs that I've been doing here on the channel. And I think I've done a decent job at showing kind of my learning process, go from one end to the other. Okay, so the dam's going to be over that hill right there. Then I think the dam is a little bit further. I thought I heard a wolf. I think the dam is a little bit further to the right than I was. I think that's just my footsteps, but I swear to God I hear something running around. Is there an avalanche risk right here? I wonder. It doesn't look like there's too much snow on the top of the hill, so I don't think so. But that would be another thing the game developers should think about is perhaps avalanche zones that you have to be concerned about. Firing a gun in the wrong spot can definitely cause some major problems. Sound waves have a lot more force than people realize. Avalanches are... I don't think I've ever seen an avalanche in real life. I think that's one of the few phenomena that I haven't seen. I've seen lava, I've seen volcanoes, I've seen caves, I've gone spelunking, I've cave dived and all that fun stuff. I, I've gone down in mines that were abandoned. I've done all kinds of ridiculous stuff when I was a geologist, but I don't think I've ever seen... Yeah, I don't think that I've ever seen an avalanche. Geologists, we don't go into the snow. There's no point. This right here, this white stuff, it covers up everything that we want to see. It's the same thing like a geologist is going to spend a lot of his time out in the desert because grass and just foliage and flora, they cover up what it is that you're there to see. And so unfortunately, you're left with big rocks like these, which are called float. These big rocks right here, they're not attached to bedrock. They're called float. They're not in situ, which is Latin for in place or something like that anyways. That over there would be more than likely in C2, but you, if it's not in C2, it's not useful to you because you can't figure out you know, where it came from. 
and the further away from the source you are, the more weather is exempt. It's There's a bunch of little rules and things that you learn when you're out in the field. Too many for me to explain right now. You learn to, like, interpret the color of the ground, for example, by looking at the color of the stones and the earth that are around you, kind of the floaty bits that I was just telling you about. There's a deer over here. We might be able to scavenge something off of him. 0.6 kilograms. Not really worth the expenditure of our hatchet, so I don't think I'm going to do it. I know kind of where we are right now. I think we started off around here, but I don't think we've been to this deer tower, so I think I'll check it out real fast. Yeah, some supplies in here. So there's a pork and beans and a bandage. I mean, it's something that's... Oh, and actually there's painkillers right there. We needed those earlier on, and we just had a lot of trouble finding them, unfortunately. So we got the painkillers. Our cold... We're going to lose some condition on this one, I can virtually guarantee you. But I'm, I'm perfectly fine with sort of wandering around the map and just getting a feel for where we're at. I think this is going to lead this clear-cut area. If we go off to the right over here. Because back up there and to the right is where the cabin is. So if we go over that way at all, I think it's going to lead us back to the trapper's cabin. But if we go off this way, I don't think I've been through this forest. And there may still be bodies or something else that we could scavenge out here to maybe get a few more parts to repair our gear later on. I've been looking at most of our coats and things are sitting at around 50 something percent durability and so we are going to need to use up some of the cloth that we've stockpiled and some of the leather in the near future but for right now i think we're in decent shape i tend to wait a long time before i repair my gear simply based on the fact that i think most repairs do like 60 or 70 percent to your gear some of the heavier duty gear like the quality coats and things i think take they do like 25 or 30 percent but for the most part your larger gear pieces. Oh, we actually hit the edge of the map. So that's what I mean is the map is kind of small in this game. I'd actually really, really like to see the maps be bigger, more sprawling. I mean, the game has very, very solid foundations right now. And so anytime I offer a critique, I don't want, I want people to take it with a grain of salt because obviously I'm not a journalist. I'm not a game reviewer. I don't really know any of the objective ways by which a game is judged. I just know what's fun and what isn't. I don't like hitting hard boundaries like these. That's just me personally, but I do love the game, and so I always try and follow up when I make complaints about things or when I make observations by telling people that I do like the game because you got to stave off fanboys and things of that nature who are just like, oh my god, you critiqued a thing I love. Now I've got to be angry and roll my eyes and be bloodshot and develop diverticulosis from squeezing too hard over the next couple of days. I can't stand the fact that you don't like something that I like or that you even deigned to critique it. Critique is a good thing. Being able to criticize things, that's the foundation of a good society, is are you allowed to criticize things? And if you are, well, good society. If you're not allowed to criticize things, if they're off the shelf, that's never a good thing. That's never something to brag about if you can't critique something in a given group of people or, you know, a culture. That's bad. Everything should be up for critique. Religion, politics, video games. What is this? Hey, now. Oh, it looks like we found something new. Looks like we've got a cabin and an outhouse out here that I've never seen before. How's our, our calories looking great because we haven't been doing any labor today? Okay, so they got a shit shack over here. Let's go ahead and I love it when there's outhouses. Most people when they see an outhouse like in civilized society are like, ah, oh, damn it. But I, if I see an outhouse, I mean, I'm used to As a geologist, you just like poop out in the field over there. I mean, you just kind of find a spot where nobody's going to see you and you drop trowel. If you're feeling especially humorous, you can be like four feet away and drop trowel. But I wouldn't recommend it unless you're with people that like you a lot because you're going to suffer some reputation loss. I want to be putting slide mines down too close to the living quarters, if you know what I mean. Oh, there's a frozen dead guy in here. Okay, so apparently it's really cold in here. I'll probably, ooh, painkillers. Maybe he OD'd or something. Off we go. Looks like this has been here a while. Beef jerky. Ancient beef jerky from what our character just said. Like, wow, they haven't made this brand since the 70s. A down vest. Okay. We've got somebody who was hiding. Oh, a military-grade MRE up under the bed. Okay, so that's going to be something for later, just in case we can't get our hunt on at some point. That'll give us a nice hard reset that we can use in order to get ourselves resupplied. Oh, this anymore. I think what I might do is I might hang tight here for a bit. And we'll wait for the cold to go away because it's only 11 o'clock. And if we can ride out the storm, let's rest for an hour. We're just going to hang out and we'll wait and see if the storm goes away because I'm really not interested in running around in this storm any longer. It's negatively affecting our personal status pretty badly, actually. Okay, so cold is back down. It's obviously not that cold in here. Looks like the storm is gone, but this is actually much better weather for travel and exploration, so... I find this to be way more suitable for what we're trying to attempt right now. 
And so let's be on our way. I'm glad that when we jumped outside, there's no longer gale force winds trying to beat us down because I don't like Gale. Gale's a douche. That's, you know, like Gale Bedeker and so, yeah, okay. You guys get it, whatever. It's a name. It's a name as well as a thing. I guess from here, I still have my bearings slightly, so I know where we are. I think with the heading that we have, let's just keep an eye open. Yeah, so this brought us to the logging camp, which I've spawned here before. And I think the logging camp is on the side of the road. How long do we have, by the way? It's 1245. If you're not sure about where you are, you need to leave where you're at a lot sooner. Because if you're at a location, I wonder if you sca if you scavenge wood better here. I bet you do, because it's just it's laying around here in piles. I bet you totally do. But anyways, if you're not sure where you are on the map, leave early. Don't wait until it's like 4 in the afternoon to try and find your bearings. Start looking for your bearings around 1 or 2 in the afternoon so that you've got plenty of time just in case things go wrong and you can't find your way. The clear cut, I'm not... Eh, I know kind of where the clear cut is, but I'm not... There's a dead guy over here with his shoulder popping out. This. A summit soda, okay. I think that probably would have exploded by this point out in the cold, but got ourselves another. You guys said it was called like Took or something like that. I don't know. I've been pronouncing it wrong the entire game. I don't really care, but it's called like Took or something, and it really bothered some people. I think we should do some deep introspective looks on why it bothers some people so much. But you know what? I've never even. We call it a beanie. That's what it's called. We call it a beanie, so when you give it weird other names, I don't know what to say. Eh, it's called a beanie where I'm at. I don't think I've ever heard it call anybody call it anything. Other. I've heard people call it a stocking cap, actually, which gives it sort of a criminal bent to it, but he means stocking is in sock. For the people that <laughs> for the people that are not so down on their homonyms. Stocking, stocking, where, where, where. English is such a fun language. I bet English is a pain in the ass to learn. That would be my guess. We have a lot of improper verbs. And I've heard that that's the way by which a language is judged. Is how many improper verbs does it have or something that like change meaning based on spelling and how many homonyms it has. Let's go up over here. I don't know. I'm not a linguist. That's way outside my field of expertise. I know I've just heard some people complain about English. I've definitely heard people like classify languages by how difficult they are to learn. I've heard that Finnish is difficult to learn as well. I've heard that Finnish has a lot of irregular conjugations and things. The clear cut, I'm not seeing anything out here that's scavenge worthy. And to be frank with you, I don't know where this is. I know it's down. Oh, there's a backpack over here. Maybe I just gotta look a little bit closer. There are things laying around here and there. What have we here? An antiseptic and a tin of sardines. Okay. Well, we've got a little bit of a backup plan for our food, just in case all of our meat goes raw. Or, sorry, our meat is already raw. Because our meat goes bad in the future. I mean, we've got a couple of fallback foods. The deer do respawn, though, so... Sort of makes your life a little bit easier if you're planning on hunting as a means to sustain yourself. It's 1.30 right now, so yeah, I need to start getting my bearings now, because I've got to practice what I preach. Otherwise, I am a giant hypocrite. And so I'm going to go off this way, I guess. And I think this will put us down and around the dam somewhere. I know we're in the vicinity of the dam at the moment. Oh, we just fell, and I didn't mean to do that. Did we get a sprain from it? I'm going to take a minute and eat some venison, but we need to be careful. Don't sprint after you take a fall like that. I don't know what affects you getting a sprained ankle, whether it's you carrying too much weight and then sprinting, or whether it's falling and then sprinting shortly thereafter, but I seem to, anytime I fall and then I like run around afterwards, I feel like I get a sprain really, really in close proximity, so I don't know. They might have the two systems related somehow, falling and running seem to be linked in some way that I haven't really locked in on yet, and until I verify exactly how the system works. I don't know how to advise you, I would just say avoid running within a couple seconds after falling because it does seem to have some effect on the percent chance that you'll get a sprained ankle. I've gotten sprained ankles from falling and I've gotten them randomly just running as well, but I seem to get them the most when I sprint shortly after falling. So I'm guessing they have some kind of additive percentage chance to really trigger the status effect. I couldn't honestly say, oh there's a mobile home over here. 
There is actually, I thought this map was a lot smaller than it is. I feel like I was being a little bit unfair to the game earlier on because I said we had scavenged everything, but there's a couple things out here that I haven't seen yet. There's a mobile home over here. I guess we could use this as kind of an away base camp if we have to in the future. I think I've got water with me too, so do I have water with me? Okay, I have, oh no, I thought I had three or, I don't know. The potable and the unsafe were swapped in my head. I thought we had a lot of unsafe water. Let's have a look around the logging camp, I suppose. I think we came down here at some point, but I don't think I dove in because we had a sprained ankle or something. There's a wolf around here somewhere, so watch ourselves. The deer isn't running, though, so if the deer is running, isn't running, that's how I... That's how I judge if weird shit is going on in my neighborhood, too. I look at my cat, and if my cat looks shaken, then I start wondering what's going on. Because my cat is super easygoing, and he never worries about anything. A soda, a newsprint roll, a whole bunch of goodies in here. So this might actually be a heavy wool sweater at 51% condition. Okay. Lots of metal containers. I don't know if we're going to be able to fire striker. I didn't even know that was in the game. So we've got a fire striker now. And I suppose that's probably going to increase our chances of being able to start a fire. We've got a whole bunch of padding and bedding around here. And one of the things you can do if you're in a survival situation is you do want to watch out for anything that has a removable stuffing. You can actually sort of reinforce some of your other things. So, for example, let's say that you find a mattress down and in here. You can take the stuffing out of it, and if you're good with sewing, you could restuff jackets and things with it. I've heard of people doing it. I don't know if it happens commonly, but it's something that I have heard of people doing. So, we've got mittens, we've got some peaches. All right. You can't take any of the papers off the walls. Can't take another toolkit. We have... That'll come in handy. Are we overweight right now? I know we've got to be getting really, really close. Our calories are looking... Let's eat some of these peaches because they're heavy. And we have a can opener anyways. So I'll just use some of this extra food. Just diversify a little bit. It is important to get enough vitamin C from fruits when you're out in the middle of nature. Because you can end up getting yourself a nasty case Looks of like scurvy. But that, that's that's over the t a long, long duration survival trip and... In all honesty, scurvy is kind of on the lower end of the spectrum for horrible things that could happen to you while you're out in nature, so wouldn't worry about it too much, not at least for a couple of weeks. Got another building over here. I'm not going to scavenge anything else, but what I am going to do is I'll just sort of take stock for what's remaining for us to search. Got a down ski jacket over here. Okay. Hope nobody needs this anymore. There's pretty much a bunch of containers over here that we could search for. Not a bad place to survive, actually, if you wanted to do something a little bit different with your playthrough. It looks like we searched that one over there. Let's also do a quick eyeball search of this over here. Do a mental inventory of things that we can come back and check for. I'm not searching things because it flags them as searched if I've already searched them. And later on, when we come back to scavenge this out, what I want to do is I want the things that I haven't searched to be unflagged so that I could just do it very, very quickly without having to wonder. Alright, so there's a couple little locations in here. There's some definite food. There's some definite supplies over here. But for right now, let's look for dead bodies too. Because these locations that were inhabited tend to have dead bodies around. Some extra firewood right here. How much weight are we carrying? Yeah, we're almost topped off. I think we may... Let's get a feel for where this is at right now. If we can find the train tracks from here... I think the train tracks are probably off. Actually, I got a little bit disoriented when we went inside. That's actually a little bit embarrassing. I think we came from that direction right there. Yeah, having refreshed my memory, I think we were moving in this direction here. So let's go back this way. The cold is still not a concern. Fatigue is going to be a problem pretty soon, but it's 2.30. Let's see if we can make our way back home. I think we've done a fair bit of adventuring today, and I'm pleased with what we've accomplished. With regards to just the general tasks that I want to do today, I think we've done very, very well. I think combing this area for dead bodies is something that can wait till later. We've got about seven minutes left in the episode, and I think we're probably going to use up the majority of that just getting back to base camp. If I'm correct, this will go around right here, and we'll hit the train tracks, and we'll probably be on the opposite side. Don't run up on me like that deer. A male deer, by the way, are very aggressive if it's the rut. 
So be careful about that if you're out in a, if you're out in the wilderness. I've had deer stand their ground with me before when I left my house. Back when I used to, right after I graduated from high school and I was living on my parents' little ranch thing that they have going on now. I had a deer stand his ground with me before. I went out to my car to grab something and the deer was in between my car and the house. And I just started walking towards him because I figured he'd give way like they always do. And I think it must have been the breeding season or something because he held his ground with me and he snurfed at me and he stomped the ground a little bit. Like, I don't give a damn who you think you are. And to that I said, okay, you have large protrusions of death on top of your head. I think I'm going to leave you alone. I'm going to get a feel for where we're at over here. I think the map may actually be bigger than I had expected in the past. So this is a train loading area. Let me see if I can find the tunnel from here. I think, yeah, there's the bridge right there. So we want to go back this way. So if we hit this and we go to the left, that's going to take us over to there. I don't think I've looked in and over to the right either. So that does leave us a little bit of adventuring. Adventuring to do in the future. It's got a little bit of meat on it. Yeah, let's harvest it. Why not? Let's take a minute out. 1.2 kilograms is enough to where I care. I wonder if I can drop any of this gear. We are going to be over in cumber now, I think, which means that we have a chance to sprain our ankle. So let's drink a little bit of water and see if maybe we can get ourselves down below the threshold. That got us close. Let's eat a venison. Oh, did I just eat a raw? I may have just eaten a raw. No, I ate a cooked. Okay. Ah, it still didn't get us there. Oh, well, it got us a little bit closer. I'm just going to run back this way, and if we make it, we make it. If we don't, we don't. If I sprain an ankle, we'll have plenty of time to recover anyways. If it ends up happening, what I'll probably do is I'll make a cut while we go in between these locations. Because these long walks, I don't think that they're incredibly entertaining. Me beating feet across the entire map doesn't seem like something that I'd be interested in watching. Then again, who knows what draws people to the Nerd Castle anymore. I'm kind of... Eh, I have no idea anymore. I used to have, like, a pretty good idea of what people liked and didn't like. And as time has gone along, this has all become sort of second nature to me recording these episodes. I don't want to waste a bullet on a wolf right now, so I'm going to give myself a wide berth. Wherever these wolves are at, I would totally prefer not to shoot them. I don't want to kill anything in nature right now. Oh, good, we're exhausted. I do want to mess around over by our house. I may try to make a snow fort. Because you can do that right here with snow shelter. It seems like it takes a lot of calories to do. But you can make a snow fort. And you can sleep inside of it. Sort of like a little igloo. Or honestly all you really need is a trench. Snow is not as cold as people think. You can sleep on top of it as long as you have something in between you and the snow. And so what you would want to have is like a bed pad. And maybe something to keep you up off the ground. But you can dig down into the ground. And all you really want to get yourself out of is the wind factor. If you got wind chill going against you that's the worst part. If you can dig a little ditch right here like a little trench. That's deep enough for you to put a just a small cot. It doesn't even need to be a tall cot. It needs to be like three or four inches off the ground. Just about anything will work, to be honest. Mm, I have no idea where they're at right now. There he is. So I'll go around the back side of the train cart right here. And we'll try and avoid expending a bullet on him. Because he's far enough away to where going out and harvesting the body tomorrow is going to take us a fair bit of time. And it's just not going to be suitable for us. So I did notice that there's a lot of clothing and things back at our base. This playthrough is stretched out over the course of like a week now for me and my recording schedule. So I've forgotten what we've had stored. I ran through the log cabin back here and I had a look at all the things that were around. And it looks like we've got a lot of stuff stored up. We are going to have to spend a day or so, I think, repairing our gear very, very soon. That's the only thing that I've been thinking about lately is just like long-term sustainable survivability. And as it is right now... As it stands right now, I think we've got a lot of the things that we need to survive for at least a couple more days. We're on day 7 right now, and I think the supplies that we have on hand at the moment will more than likely last us up till day 9 or day 10. And so actually, I think we may be able to do a 50-day survival. I may not televise it all, or I may not record it all, but I would love to showcase it. Our house is going to be right around that big rock over there. And I would love to be that guy on YouTube that manages to survive that long. I don't know if any of the other YouTube... You guys watch a lot more YouTube videos than I do. Frankly, I'm busy so much of the time just between recording, talking to other YouTubers, setting up things with developers. It becomes a very, very time-consuming hobby to do this on YouTube. And definitely, once a network comes along that offers to pay you to do this, it becomes a lot easier to do it because then you're reimbursed for your time. But still, at the same time, it's the same thing as with a survival situation. When you 
you only have so many hours in the day. It's like common life. I guess it's not even survival situations. That's just real life, being an adult. Sometimes you don't have the time to do the things that you want to do, and so you've got to sort of ration things out and make sure that you've got time to do each and every one of the activities that you put in front of yourself. And what I find anymore with YouTube is that I spend... The hell you are. He sounds super close. Where is he? Oh, they need to work on that sound effect or something because it sounds like he's right on top of me. Wow, that was creepy as hell. It looks like we got a storm that's come in right now, but we should be able to get back to the house before anything else goes wrong. We're walking a lonely road right now. We're playing Green Day silently in our head on the boulevard of broken dreams. God, that was an album that got way played out. I've never been a giant Green Day fan. They've always been kind of like a... Even back in the Operation Ivy days, they were sort of like a fallback band for me. I, I don't know. They've never been one of my favorites. They've always been like, eh, if there's nothing else on the radio. And I prefer their older stuff from the Dookie days versus their newer stuff. Because as far as bands go, bands that sold out and kind of gave up on everything they believed in, Green Day is pretty high on the list. They were definitely, I mean, Operation Ivy, if you weren't into the music scene back in those days with like the, I think that was second generation ska. Anyways, back in those days, a lot of the bands were very anti the man and very anti selling out and Green Day used to tour with a lot of them and that was very much sort of their mentality as well. And I think as they got older, they started to realize that you have to sell out. Kids out there who are like 15 or 16 right now, I guess teenagers, not 15 or 16 year olds, I guess I'll distinguish it a bit, but if you're an adolescent, the world is going to, like, all of the music and the bands that you listen to are going to be like, man, don't sell out, underground, blah, blah, blah. I'm just here to tell you as a 28-year-old who has lived through the music scene, if you're going to make any money and feed yourself, you're going to have to sell out in varying degrees at some point. It's going to happen. Take it from somebody, I walked away from a musical career because I didn't want that to happen. I felt like the music contract that I was offered with me and my band was... I felt like it was a sellout account where they were telling us things that we had to wear and things that we specifically had to do and that's one of the reasons like I wasn't in music anymore that's why I'm not in music right now is because I walked away from it because I wasn't a fan of a lot of the contracts and things that were involved with that scene and it's also a very very negative industry but one thing you'll learn if you've spent more than four or five years playing music and you know being at clubs and touring and things like that is you will learn that you have no choice but to sell out eventually. It, it, it all kind of moves towards a focal point of are you going to sell out or are you not going to? For me, I just kind of walked away from it because, eh. It's a very negative industry. It's a hard industry to be happy in. Like, a lot of people dream of playing music. And so if you're in a band right now, follow your dream. Get to that point and make the decision for yourself. Don't listen to what I'm saying right now. Just be aware that people are going to try and cheat you. People are going to try and give you bad contracts. Get a lawyer. If you ever have to sign a contract... I swear to God, go get yourself a lawyer right before you do it. Just pay, borrow money from your parents, borrow money from whoever you have to to hire a lawyer for a couple hours. But have them look at the contract because the music industry is brutal. And it will try and take everything from you if you let it. So anyways, that's my advice for the day. If that's your dream, live it yourself. Don't listen to what I'm saying right now. Go out there, get to the point where they offer you the contract. And if you get to the point where I did, where... You were sitting there just like, this totally sucks. I hate being in a car eight hours a day. I hate, you know, being in close proximity with the same four people eight hours a day. I hate being tired all the time, hungry all the time, and not getting paid all the time. Because clubs, frankly, I know I'm getting off on a little bit of a tangent right now, but clubs, for example, I would know for a fact you would have a door count at a club for 200 people. Like, you could look at the crowd and you learn to eyeball crowds after a while because that's how you get paid is by the amount of people that come to the show. And... You would have a crowd that's 250 people, and you know that there was a door charge of $50, and you know that there was a minimum drink limit, and then at the end of the night, do the math right there, 200 people, $15 a piece getting in, and at the end of the night, headlining, the club manager would give you 150 bucks, and you'd just be like, wow, and that's to pay six people to play music, and that's why I got out of the music industry, it's just too shady. Club owners are just scum. They really, truly are. So anyways, I'm off my tangent. That's my soapbox for the day. Club owners are terrible human beings, and I hope they fall down and sprain their ankles repeatedly in a snowbank. I will see you all in the next episode. Take care out there, everybody. I do. I will see you all later.